This is Richard Nikolai Free, the animal.com. Anybody in paleo knows that one of the very biggest things, I guess it would be 2012, was Terry Walls' uh, TED Talk. It just, it was wildfire and it inspired so many people. And I even, as a, a personal anecdote, I we have a family friend who had MS and she we we somehow got onto an email exchange on a different topic and it turns out that she was helping a lot of her symptoms uh oh great because of terry walls and she had no idea that i had been into paleo and lost a lot of weight and blogged about it and so on so it was really really cool um, from a, from just a personal standpoint, I do have a bone to pick with Terry, however, and that is at HS11, I spoke and I was up against Dr. Andreas Einfeld from over there across the pond somewhere, and we had this standing thing going of who's going to get more people in his room, and I think I and and we agreed that I beat him, but but then uh, with HS12, I look at the schedule and I'm like. Who am I? I'm up against the phenomenon of 2012. <laughs> I still, I still did okay, but but the the, re, the only reason I do is because I typically just go so much over the top that some people just have to see what's he gonna say next. But uh, but I know that Terry had a great presentation there, and I'm happy to welcome her, Terry. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here. Okay, now. You have a book coming out. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, the Walls Protocol. Yes. How to be progressive MS using paleo principles and functional medicine. Now, um, what do you? What would you say is? What would you say is your prime topic? Uh, uh, what? What? I, I know that I know that it has paleo in it and uh, and everything. But what is it about paleo that relates to MS? So uh, uh, many people with MS, they're going to come to it from uh, a host of possibilities. One is food sensitivities, food allergies, uh, gluten, uh, dairy uh, being the most common culprits, but other food allergies uh, can happen. Uh, toxic overload can certainly happen, uh, chronic infections, vitamin D. So it's a whole host of possibilities. And uh, moving to a, um, away from a grain-based diet uh, to the Walls diet, which is a very structured paleo diet, will dramatically increase their uh, nutrition for their brain and for the mitochondria. Okay. So far so, all right, so, because some, uh, people are going to, you know, I'm going to put in stuff in Google and people are going to stumble on this, uh, you know, for whatever reason, whatever they might be looking for. So give us, give it, you're, you, uh, you're a medical doctor. And so yeah. give us, give us a brief, uh, um, uh, you know, people hear MS, multiple sclerosis. What is it? What does it mean? What does that, what does that do to you? Okay. So, uh, there's a problem with the brain uh, and or spinal cord. Uh, you have two episodes separated by time and location. Uh, and that's um, like an episode of optic neuritis, which I had in 87. And then in 2000, uh, weakness in my left leg. I had uh, abnormal lesions in my spinal cord and abnormal spinal fluid. So that clearly made, made the diagnosis of MS. Uh, the current thinking is that the body, the uh, is immune cells are attacking the myelin, which is the insulation on the uh, connective wiring in the brain. Uh -huh. the, the conventional thinking is that sometime as a young person, uh, probably between the age of 10 and 15, I had some type of infection, uh, perhaps a virus, perhaps a chlamydia, perhaps a Lyme, uh -huh. that I did not completely clear. And so this very... Uh, latent infection uh, created a problem where my immune cells began to slowly attack my brain. And then unknown environmental factors are also important that seem to uh, really drive the worsening of the disease. Uh -huh. And study after study will say that probably 70 to 95% of my risk for MS have to do with these unknown environmental factors. Uh -huh. 
it, and what I did that was so brilliant was I created a protocol to take all those environmental factors, diet, what we're doing, uh, what we eat, uh, stress management, exercise, and shifted them towards health promoting. Uh-huh. And created this diet designed very intentionally to maximize the uh, vitamin, mineral, essential fat content. The, the 31 nutrients that I, that I identified were critical for brain and mitochondrial health. Okay, so so what you're it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but but what you're saying is that is that your solution and what you think might be a solution for other MS or other like I suppose there's related conditions. So what what I observe in my clinical practice is this approach uh, reduces symptoms for essentially all chronic disease. Yeah, you know, uh, autoimmune diseases, heart diseases, diabetes, mood disorders, traumatic brain injury. Um, it lowers inflammation, improves health and vitality, and over time, people look younger, have fewer symptoms, and generally need fewer and fewer medications. Okay, now what do you chalk it up to? Do you chalk it up to grabbing a spear, putting on a loincloth, and running around, or is it something and calling yourself a caveman, or is it something else? <laughs> Well, that'd be pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it has to do with uh, the food choices. And, you know, keep in mind, we modern day hunter gatherers, we're using agricultural products still. Uh-huh. We are getting foods grown in farms that are brought to us. What we're doing, though, is, at least, at least my plan is, I'm telling people which are the most nutrient dense foods in this agricultural model. Uh, and how to organize that to maximize your nutrition. What is nutrient density? So that would be like your uh, vitamin, mineral, antioxidant content per calorie of food consumed. Mm -hmm. And most of our uh, nutrition specialists, registered dietitians, will all agree that your greatest health is going to be achieved by eating the most nutrient-dense diet. Mm -hmm. That is, you want to get the most vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, essential fats per cow. So how come every time every time I see a news thing and it, it the new the new the new news uh, yes. says identifies or it's marketing or something identifies the this newest superfood, right? Can you explain to me how come it's always some kind of a plant or berry and it's never like beef liver or oysters? Or oh, muscles. It's, uh, it's a certain level of bias. You know, it, and the other thing uh, that makes me crazy is uh, superfood. Uh, you know, I'm not interested in Amazonian superfood. I want my superfood to be stuff that I'm growing in my yard mm-hmm. uh, so it has the maximum nutrient <laughs> density. Mm-hmm. If you get something halfway around the world and you ship it, you're going to lose nutrition here. Plus, as you correctly note, uh, nutrient density, particularly in organ meats like uh, liver, like heart, uh, like uh, the adrenal glands, uh, brain tissue, uh, incredibly nutrient dense. I um, I don't know if you had time to review it, but it, it was it, that when when we exchanged a couple of emails before this, yes. I was like I was like no way she's into that. And the th- the thing is, is I don't know if you caught it, but Matt Lalonde at a, at the same conference in Boston, did a, a presentation on yes. nutrient density, right? And I'm all into that because I, I debated a vegan uh, on the internet, and and oh, actually there was uh, telephone people listening too. But I challenged the vegans. I said, okay, I said, I said, take four ounces of beef liver. Do any mix of fruits that you, this was, these were like raw vegans, fruitarian, vegan type thing. I said, take four ounces of beef liver. Tell me how much of whatever mix of fruit you want to do gives you roughly an average uh, equivalent nutrition. Use Fit Day, use whatever. Turns out five pounds. And it was a vegan who worked that out. Five pound, four ounces of beef liver five pounds of fruit yeah I, t- I i took it a step further and i started looking at grains it comes out if you just average out the whatever fit day gives you it's like 26 or 27 so just average those out 
uh, it turned out like calorie for calorie, beef liver had 2,600% more nutrition than a calorie of bread. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's you know, the bio concentration of it. Right. Okay. It ended, oh, so, okay. uh, it's fine. Know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, organ meat, I think, is critical, and that's a big part uh, of the nutritional plan I advocate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, all right, let me play devil's advocate. Let's say, okay, Terry, I, you know what? I really like my white flour um, uh, done in fry bread, and that's all I want to eat, but I know that I can get all of these nutrients from supplements. I go on all these websites and I can ha I have like 75 supplements I take every day uh, to 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 well, a, to actually on the numbers for those 26 or so nutrients get as much nutrition as you what do you say to that so uh, let's take uh, folate for example uh, you can get a synthetic form of folate Mm -hmm. um, or you get your folate from the liver or uh, from the greens. In either place, whether you're getting it from your green leaves or the liver, you're going to have related compounds that are all biologically active. And when the scientists first named folate uh, as the vitamin, they just tried to pick what they thought was the most active form of this family of related compounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, the observation is that all of these nutrients that we use are related compounds. If we get them in food, mm -hmm. we'll get hundreds, thousands of other related compounds that will act as a system within our cells. So they'll be more effective. You mean there? You mean there may be stuff out there, synergies that we have no idea about? Uh, there were absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, the supplements that we're taking. Do you want to be taking things that have been manufactured synthetically in China? Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of this stuff is being made. Uh, when the vitamins uh, and antioxidants are made synthetically, they will not have necessarily the same shape that they have when they are made in, uh, in biologic systems. Right. Uh, and so they will have a slightly different shape, which means they will interact in a different way with the receptors in our cell. Mm -hmm. So they will be uh, less effective or overly effective. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's a problem. Uh, another problem is some of these uh, vitamins and supplements are now uh, made by genetically modified bacteria mm -hmm. uh, with uh, their unknown uh, implications. Rather than like bacteria in your gut that like make short chain fatty acids, for example, from fibers that you eat in plants. Correct. You know, the wild type bacteria that hopefully we have, although many of us are, have unwittingly, if we, because if we're not diligently eating um, uh, organic food, we may have unwittingly eaten uh, GMO foods, mm -hmm. uh, including uh, GMO uh, bacterial products, etc. So I fear even those of us who are trying very hard to avoid GMOs are going to find it increasingly difficult to keep that out of our diet. Okay. So, okay. And, um, add one more thing. So, in my own personal recovery, uh, uh, in my uh, journey of healing, I had slowly identified vitamins and supplements that were found in mouse models to be helpful at protecting brains and mitochondria. So, I added those. That slowed the speed of my decline, uh, and I was grateful. Uh, I discovered functional medicine, added more supplements. Again, that flattened out uh, my decline. When I redesigned my eating plan, uh, it, which had been paleo since 2002, but I redesigned it to maximize nu my nutrition based on these 31 nutrients, uh -huh. that's when the magic happened. That's when I went in a year from sort of climb wheelchair to biking 18 miles. So in other words, in other words, you, in you, someone, someone so, so if I'm kind of getting this, uh, if, 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 if I could, uh, if I could ask you if I'm on the right track. So say I'm just average Joe out there. Um, uh, just, you know, a standard decent paleo type of diet where you're focusing on sourcing your own meat, fish, fowl, vegetables, fruits. That's how I always used to like to, used to like, or I like to put it. 
uh, you, you you probably do fine. But if you if you actually have a condition like you have, then yes. it just it may not be enough. You may need to really get down in there and look at actually the nutrition and instead of just buying supplements you maybe there's some supplements a few yeah, if you I, want to take I, like vitamin d is is like top of the list for me and k2 is the other one um but uh, so you're saying that you really need to get down there and but you can you can actually do it from real foods you can really and i i remember your ted talk i mean all you need is that it, it was like two minutes and i think you said Here's what you need, you know, a plate of this, a plate of that, a plate of that, and right, and, right. So uh, for your listeners, it's uh, a plate of green leaves, a plate of sulfur-rich vegetables, cabbage family, onion family, mushrooms, asparagus, mm -hmm. a plate of things colored all the way through beets, carrots, uh, berries, peppers, you know, that kind of stuff. Grass-fed so, meat. So even some, star some starchy vegetables too. No starchy vegetables. Okay, well, uh, car don't carrots it. have a little bit of sugar and yes, and so forth. yes. Okay. But you don't need to be taking potatoes. Huh? You don't need potatoes. Okay. I like potatoes. But... All right. <laughs> well, you know, if, um, it, it depends. Uh, if you have, and I tell folks, if your ideal body size, you have robust health, uh, you're on no medicines, then you don't have to uh, follow the diet as rigorously as somebody who has health mm -hmm. issues or is no longer at the ideal body weight. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is in, 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 in essence, what you're doing is carving out, or I, I, I don't know if that's the right word, I just popped into my head, but you're basically, you're ba you know, there are, for example, a ketogenic diet is very well established as therapeutic for like cancers and things like that. Yes. And, and so, okay, go ahead. So in my book, I, I talk about the Walls diet, uh, mm -hmm. then... Uh, the Walls Paleo Diet, which provides a little more structure, more emphasis on organ meats, mm -hmm. uh, and the Paleo Plus, which is the ketogenic version uh, of my diet. Mm -hmm. So I give people um, uh, a variety of options to choose from with a fair amount of guidance in terms of where I think they should go, depending on their health issues. Now, another, now another variation on the Paleo, he's very popular in the Paleo community, is uh, uh, Paul Jaminet, and he has the perfect health diet. How would you how would you differentiate his version of paleo ish? I know he includes rice in his in in his, but but otherwise it's it's he's he has pretty much a nutrient dense diet as far as I can see. Right. So there's considerable uh, overlap, um, or a lot of similarities. Uh, I would say that I have uh, probably a higher nutrient density. Because he has uh, a lot more starch mm -hmm. uh, in the diet. Of course, exactly. So yeah. You add that starch, you decrease the nutrient density. Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it's a, a bit of a philosophical difference. So although I would say uh, the Walls diet uh, uh, at the level one and the Perfect Health diet uh, probably have a fair amount of overlap. Okay. I provide a, a little more structure uh, in terms of which vegetable groups I want you to be eating from. Uh, in which fruit groups I want you to be eating from. Because I, I think most people, we don't know how to uh, repeatedly, day after day, mac uh, have a diet that maximizes our B vitamin intake, vitamin C, A, K intake, and mineral intake, mm -hmm. unless you give us very clear guidelines. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we never really learned as a culture how to do that. Let me ask you, let me, provide that. Let me ask you this. Have you... Have you uh, uh, now? I know you know your 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 diet probably does not include uh, dairy products to any no. extent. Uh, uh, yeah. Perhaps maybe except the fat, just the fat portions. Right. Right. Uh, okay. Get that okay. Gee. right. okay. So, so uh, have you in in your thinking about your your nutrition and the balances and everything? Have you ever looked at mammalian milk as kind of a template because it seems to me intuitively that mammalian milk would have the proper vitamins and minerals all in the relative right proportions to one to another to some to some, as it's as just a, a template do, what do you think of that it's an interesting thought i um 
I don't know the uh, vitamin content of milk. I believe that generally depends on the nutritional status of the dam or the female producing the milk. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think we can count on that mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to be so dependent on the intake of uh, the food for the mother. Uh, what I did use, though, was uh, the dietary analyses of traditional peoples eating their traditional diets in the hunter-gatherer society, mm -hmm. that their RDAs are one and a half to uh, ten times the RDAs. And uh, interestingly, uh, there, um, the Caltons did an analysis of the primal diet, the paleo diet, Atkins diet, South Beach diet, uh, uh, the USDA diet, and to see how, how everybody shook out. And of course, the paleo primal diets were among the highest, but they didn't hit all the RDAs. Yeah, and I think uh, the reason for that uh, is that uh, partly nutrient density of our foodstuffs are going down. And unless you design even our paleo primal diets very intentionally, it's hard for people to know how to create a maximally nutrient dense diet. Right. When, when we analyzed uh, the Walls diet, uh, the week's worth of menus, we have that one and a half to 10 times the RDAs. And it looks much more like the same kind of profile. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you get when you look at the traditional hunter-gatherer diets. And that's because I, I designed it that way intentionally uh, so I could emulate those nutrient uh, patterns because my interpretation is over the thousands of generations, those because the nutrient densities are very similar, whether it's an Eskimo or the Amazonian rainforest or the Aborigines uh, or the folks in the Kalahari. So that told me that that is probably a closer representation of what our nutritional needs are. And that was the template that I was trying to match. So I kept tweaking my diet in the food plan and how I was organizing the food plan so we could get a nutritional analysis that uh, is reproducible and consistent with what the hunter-gatherers are getting across the globe. And that's and it's amazing, and, and it's amazing because none of those hunter gatherers have a Surgeon General or a USDA. It's amazing. Oh, they had <laughs> research thousands of generations. Yeah, yeah, it's it's learned knowledge. But I'm going to get to Surgeon General when I get to questions because I asked some people what some questions uh, for you. But but uh, so let, but I want to I want to ask you one thing before I get to that, and that is. Uh, tell us about, uh, I mean, I know from your TED Talk, and, and I'm not sure if it's from the TED Talk or because I've been following you for a long time, um, but I'm not sure if it's from the TED Talk or something else I saw from you, but y you have you have been e involved with or conducting studies, and I know for sure that you must have been, you must be getting either anecdotes plus or minus so, from all sorts of people. Can you yes. speak to that for a little bit? Sure. So uh, we have hundreds of reports from people who follow me on social media in terms of the dramatic improvement that they're experiencing. So, so we've got that. With we MS have, or, uh, or, well, or both? Uh, MS, MS is probably the most common, but uh, Parkinson's is also very common. Mm -hmm. Mood disorders, diabetes, heart disease, mm -hmm. and then other autoimmune things, uh, also of colitis, uh, Crohn's disease, lupus, RA, uh, psoriasis, those kinds of things. Uh, clinically, that's what I see as well. In our clinical trial, uh, we've written up uh, the first uh, uh, experiment, and I'm in that back and forth uh, with the reviewers, uh, so hopefully we'll have it accepted here in the next few weeks. Good. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, more papers that are uh, being written about these marvelous, uh, very exciting results. We have uh, uh, another study that is underway, uh, uh, with relapsing remitting, that's going very well. And we have just opened another study with uh, progressive MS that is just uh, using a food intervention and doesn't use the other lifestyle changes uh, that I made. Okay, so is it safe to say that you've been doing this for, for a while, so, so you, you, you're confident that you know what you're doing, but you're a physician as well, and so you put it to the test with your own patients and studies and everything. So is it safe to say that now after seeing everything that's come in that you're all in on this? 
Oh, well, I've been all in for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. well, all right. All right. I know you are. Okay. Now, a, a couple of questions uh, that I, and I only had a chance to do this right before we got on, but uh, one, one person uh, from social media asked, uh, uh, ask her, ask her if she had to pick the single most important thing she did to defeat her MS, what would that be? And I think we've probably covered that, but if you have anything to, more to say about that. Uh, it's, it's, it's critical, uh, the nutrient-dense diet, uh, so it's the foods that I eat, plus making sure I stay away from the uh, gluten, dairy, eggs, uh, if I have any of those. Oh, uh, eggs too, huh? Yeah. Eggs. So uh, in terms of food allergy risk, it goes gluten, dairy, eggs, soy, peanuts, nightshades. Really? Uh, so I, I take out the three worst offenders for our clinical uh, trials, and then we uh, teach people how to identify uh, are they having problems with other uh, high risk foods? Okay. Okay. Now, here's I, I love when this question came in. It's like, if elected, well, appointed, I should say, Surgeon General, here I told you it was going to come up, what would be the foundation of your platform? What three things can we do now to improve our health? And I, I would actually rephrase that. If, if, and uh, you know I'm an apolitical person. I don't even yeah. even vote. Uh, you know I I don't uh, and like I tell people I I wouldn't do that to you. I don't care about imposing my will on other people, uh, even if I get to be in the biggest mob. But that's just my point of view. But you know just playing along. If you were Surgeon General, what would be the and dealing with all the politics and everything? What would be your general platform? You know, what I think would be particularly brilliant and uh, would probably fit with some of my uh, Republican uh, friends, uh, but maybe they wouldn't like this either, would be to tax uh, sugar, white flour, high fructose corn syrup to pay for the diseases they cause <laughs> so that uh, people would have the true cost of consuming uh, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, white flour uh, that uh, there was going to incur. Uh, so that we could uh, increase the consumption of vegetables, berries, meat, uh, wholesome foods, and have people pay the real cost of consuming white flour, sugar, high fructose, corn syrup. Well, one, and one way, one alternate way to do that would be to quit subsidizing all of those too, so that they actually well, got to market at real cost. Uh, well, marketing at real cost would be helpful, but if we had to, <laughs> if we had to pay the cost. Uh, that these are going to uh, uh, cost us in terms of lost productivity, uh, the adverse uh, consequence on our health, uh, it would be much greater. Great. Okay. So uh, now we have a final uh, segment here that uh, Terry gave me the okay to uh, go for because this is Free the Animal and we talk about anything we want to here. And I know, I, you know, uh, I... I'm just guessing. I'm, I, you know, I'm just guessing, and and I know that uh, I know that it might make Terry a little bit uncomfortable. But I'm just wondering, Terry, would you like to tell us about your son Zach? Oh, sure. People may have heard uh, about this 19-year-old uh, young man who went to the Iowa State House to defend his two moms when the legislative body was uh, debating banning gay marriage. Uh, that was my son, Zach Walls, and he defended uh, me and my wife, uh, Jackie, uh, quite eloquently in terms of explaining that we're just like any other ordinary family. We go to church, we have fights, we go on vacation, we have chores, we do work, um, but we expect that we should get fair and equal treatment uh, from the law. Mm -hmm. uh, he spoke eloquently, uh, very movingly. Uh, that video went viral. I think he's had 20 million views. Uh -huh. uh, he's been speaking around the country in terms of ad advocating for um, a civil discourse uh, on the issue of gay families. Uh, and he, in fact, uh, was invited to speak at the Democratic National uh, Convention, I think on the basis of his advocacy work. Good. Um, and what happened is that put Jackie and I uh, in the limelight as well. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. To be, I was thinking about this as I was... Pacing, I pace when I when I think about stuff. So, I, and I have this ball in the backyard, so I kick it from one end to the other as I'm kicking, and I'm like, and I'm thinking, like, isn't it very interesting? Maybe 
maybe Terry's video went viral because her son's video went viral. You know, I mean, yeah. it's it's really interesting. Now, here's the, the other the the thing that was interesting to me about that is is that you know you're a you're a physician you're you're trained scientifically and I've been a paleo blogger and so for the last five years you know uh, even though I'm a total layman and when I first started reading medical studies I was like what's that and I just said just keep reading them because you'll make connections and eventually you know right. And so, but one thing, one thing that you learn about the scientific method, or just basically plain logic, is that is that is that is about falsification, and uh, one exception can disprove the rule. And so, in the in terms of gay marriage, it seems to me that what Zach really accomplished. If I look at what did Zach accomplish, it was the notion. It was the notion that you must have. A male and a female to properly raise a well-adjusted offspring, and and he just obliterated that in one video. I mean, I, I loved his introduction. So you know, I was Eagle Scout. I was a small business owner. You know, I, I scored the top uh, percentile in the ACT test, and I was raised by two women. Yeah. So I'm I thinking, okay. Hey, one, one last, go ahead. Yes. I'm going to have to plug in my power cord or it's going to be cut off. Okay, I'm going to go one, 30 more seconds here. Okay, so, so we're good. So, so uh, I'm thinking, what are the chances 200, 500 years from now when, you, when they read the history books and there's that little short chapter about how people couldn't actually decide what values in other people and personalities and genitals that they preferred – uh, and 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 what what are the chances that Zach is going to end up in there for the one who said the biggest argument was for children and he blew it out of the water? It'll be fun to watch. It, it will be. It, it'll be fun to watch. Uh, he's doing pretty great work. Who knows? Uh, Jack and I laugh. We have to take good care of ourselves just in case he makes it to the White House. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I'm going to bid you farewell and uh, get your computer charged. And uh, I hear Zach's coming over for dinner tonight. That's right. Say hi Oops. for him for me and tell him to watch this interview. Okay, sounds good. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Terry.